Burnout is a particular type of stress that is linked to work and the work environment. Today, executive coach Monique Valcor joins us to talk about the symptoms of burnout and how to beat it. Welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast, your free weekly resource to make you a better fitness business leader. I'm JT, the boss of Active Management, and I'm pumped with the rest of the Active Management team to be the premier sponsor again in 2017. Doing this helps us achieve our why in business, which is to reduce the healthcare costs across the globe. So we love supporting it. Between you and us, we can get more people moving and more often. So let's get our hustle mode on. No matter where you are listening in the world, make sure you check out www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com forward slash active for an extra special business resource to free up time for you so that you can then do what you love. Okay, enough from me. Who's on this week's show, Chantel? Now, I know what you might be thinking. You work in fitness, so how could that possibly be a stressful environment? But think about those times when you're concerned about the number of members that you've got in your facility, the number of PT sessions that you've got booked for this week, when you're worrying about your finances, how much money is going into the bank account, how much money is coming out of the bank account, or when you're dealing with challenging staff. In addition to all of that, think about how your clients might be faced with burnout in their workplaces and the effect that that might have on their state of mind when they're coming to you for training. Today, our special guest, Monique Valcour, is going to share with us the common symptoms of burnout and how it's different to stress. She talks about how the symptoms can affect our workplace relationships. She's got tips for managers to recognise employee burnout and how to best facilitate balance for your team. And she leaves us with great advice to help you achieve a more balanced life. Before we get into this week's show, I do have a favor to ask, and I haven't asked for a few weeks now. If you enjoy the show and you're finding that you have been able to grow your business as a result of the things that you've heard and the advice that you've gotten, then could I please ask you to jump onto iTunes and leave us a review? I promise it won't take long. All you need to do is go onto iTunes, then go to podcasts, type in the fitness business podcast, click on ratings and reviews, and then click on leave a review. Thank you so much in advance. The fitness business podcast is very appreciative of our podcast partners. Here's a quick word from one of our partners. Are you ready to take control of your day-to-day management? Head to onefitstop.com for a complete platform to manage your fitness business. This week's flashback show is show 39, when Lisa Maltman joined us to talk about how sleep can impact ourselves, our business, our teams, and our clients. And I thought that that show was particularly relevant given today's topic. So if you did miss it, go back and check it out. It was one of our real, real favorites for 2016. It's show 39, and you can find it on iTunes or just head over to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Monique Valcour is an executive coach, keynote speaker, and workshop leader. She believes that everyone has the right and capacity to thrive at work and in their lives beyond work. Monique's coaching expertise is built on over 12 years of work as a management professor combined with rigorous coach training, certification, and high-level coaching experience in multiple countries and industries. She has served as a professor of management on the faculties of the EDHEC Business School in France and Boston College in the US. She coaches and provides training in leadership development and career management for United Nations and for several top business schools. Welcome along to the show, Monique. Thank you very much, Chantal. Now, given our topic of discussion today, I'm sure that our tribe are wondering how you stay on top of your workload. Do you want to maybe start off by telling us or maybe sharing three apps, systems or rituals that you use to stay focused and not get overwhelmed? Sure. I would say the foundation of my own well-being is a daily exercise habit 
that I've had since about the age of 20. I like to get uh, outside as much as possible. I live in the mountains, so I do a lot of hiking, and I find that pretty much about as long as I hit about five days a week, and I've been doing that for decades, um, that really keeps me very centered. So that's probably the primary thing. Then I would say the principle that I live by and that I recommend to others is to really pay attention to what energizes me and to what drains me and use that awareness in making decisions about what I take on, what I say no to, and where I invest my time and my energy. And uh, it's funny, actually staying on top of my workload, staying centered is a real challenge for me. Avoiding procrastination in particular is one of my challenges. So I have a number of different strategies I use there. I've long been a practitioner of yoga and uh, breath work, uh, and I find that's vitally important for me to stay centered. And I also try to recognize and to celebrate whatever progress I make, even when it's something small, just moving a project forward by a little chunk. I find that a sense of progress is really energizing. I think that one's really important because I think it's fair to say that so many of us suffer from that habit of procrastinating over things. So tackling things that chunk at a time or a bite at a time is a really good way to handle that. So you're here today to talk to us about burnout. And I was hoping that you might be able to actually start by defining what is burnout. Absolutely. So burnout is a particular type of job stress. It's a syndrome of three different main components. And and it's primarily characterized as a state of physical, emotional, or mental exhaustion combined with doubts about your competence and the value of your work. And Monique, quite often we hear people talk about being stressed in work or stressed in their life. Where does stress fit into that burnout feeling? Well, so stress is a broader overarching term that can show up in a lot of different ways. Job burnout is something that was defined by researchers back in the 1970s. There's been a lot of research on it since then. And interestingly, even though we hear the term burnout quite a bit, everybody seems to have a a sense uh, of what that means. It's actually not something that is used in the medical profession. There's not a particular clinical diagnosis for it. But it's come to us through research and through an awful lot of you know, people's personal experience of being able to identify with this feeling of exhaustion and of just being completely diminished and having sort of lost the spark for your work. So it's not, you know, you can experience stress in a number of different roles in your life. You can experience stress acutely on a short, a short-term basis and so forth. Burnout is really a chronic syndrome of stress that you're living with over time. And it arises from primarily from interpersonal sources, actually, in the workplace. So it's a particular type of stress that's linked to uh, work and the work environment. Okay, so that we all have a really thorough understanding of burnout, do you want to maybe run us through the common symptoms? Yes, absolutely. So I mentioned uh, it, it grows out of research. A lot of the research has been done by uh, Christina Maslach and Michael Leiter who are two occupational psychologists, and they've identified these three primary components that make up burnout. And you don't have to have all three, but uh, they're usually present at some level when somebody is suffering from burnout. And the first one is exhaustion. This is really the defining quality of burnout, is this feeling that you just don't have anything left to give. And it shows up um, most prominently in a sense of emotional exhaustion. It's funny, the the burnout research started off in um, helping, looking at people in helping professions and medical professions, social workers, and so forth. And it was really interesting and quite striking that what would happen is that people who have gone into a certain field of work because they are really motivated to help others would end up feeling that they just had nothing left to give to that particular mission. So the sense of you you emotionally used up, there's no more good feeling left there. And you also can, can really be physically exhausted and mentally exhausted, finding that you just can't focus, for example. Um, one of the interesting things is that burnout is really the opposite of engagement. So we're all looking at how we can have more engagement at work, how we can have our employees be engaged and committed at work. And these three main symptoms are actually 
the opposite end of the engagement spectrum. So where somebody who's burnt out is really feeling exhausted, engagement at the other end is characterized by a high level of energy for work. The second element of it is cynicism, which is really feeling that uh, you've, you've lost your connection, you don't really care anymore about the people that you're working, uh, you know, the, the targets of your work, if you're a fitness instructor, for example, the people you're teaching or your clients or your organization, perhaps. At the other end, if you're engaged, you're going to be a lot more involved in work. You're going to be a lot more excited about it. And then the final one is a sense of professional inefficacy. So when you're really engaged, you have a, a very much a can-do feeling. When you're burnt out, you feel very much can't do. So what used to be at one point in time relatively easy for you might now feel really difficult, or you might start to doubt your competence or whether you really have anything to give to this line of work. So all in all, it's a, a really diminishing feeling of you know maybe being trapped, uh, of not being able to kind of move yourself forward. It's interesting, Monique, when you're talking about each of those elements, the one that kind of, I guess, resonated with me that I think most of our our tribe here will also appreciate is that exhaustion one, because we are in an industry where we give so much and that's whether you're a fitness business owner or a personal trainer. And I certainly know from a personal trainer perspective that often you do carry so much and you do give so much to your clients at any given time. So I think that's one that we can relate to. But what it made me think is as you're talking through this, I just want to encourage everyone to think about this from two perspectives. One, from your own perspective, so whether any of these things are sounding familiar in your own workplace, your own work life, but also, of course, thinking about from our client's perspective, so if we're recognising any of these symptoms. And one of the things, one of the questions, Monique, that I had for you was, do you find that things like smartphones, social media, email, that type of thing, does that impact on our exhaustion levels? It certainly can. The thing about our connective technology that we all live with nowadays is it is, you know, it can be very, very liberating and it can increase our sense of control and enable us to be, you know, where we want to be, when we want to be there and uh, be location independent. But on the other hand, it can also feel as though we have less control, depending upon how intensively we're engaged with it, whether or not we're able to separate ourselves from our smartphones, et cetera, or whether we feel that we need to be continuously available anytime a client calls, anytime a colleague or a, a supervisor calls. You know, Do you feel that you need to immediately respond, or are you able to carve out your own space to renew yourself, to spend time with other people uh, uninterrupted. That is something that is really important. So, I mean, I'm sure I'm not alone, for example, in using my smartphone as the clock in my bedroom. So I actually have my smartphone in my bed and that's, you know, not a very good practice. I have to say, don't take my lead on that, but, uh, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you find yourself, oh, I just want to see who's on Facebook right now, it might be a clue that it's time to back off a little bit of the uh, social media usage. Fair enough. And we're going to talk a little bit more shortly about some tips or advice that you do have us in regards to actually helping us with burnout if we're finding that we're in this situation. But one of the other things I first wanted to ask you was around the uh, topic of cynicism, which was the second of the three mm -hmm. um, symptoms that you talked about most of us or many of us work in an environment with other people. So it might be teammates or it might be clients. How does that particular symptom impact our relationship with others? It can be quite deadly, actually, on our relationship with others, very corrosive, because what tends to happen when we're suffering from cynicism is we begin to depersonalize other people we see them one dimensionally and we may lose a sense of compassion for other people. So if, for example, you, you're working with clients and you're starting to recognize that there's a nasty little voice showing up in the back of your head, you know, that's kind of being very critical of your clients or being very critical of your uh, teammates at work, 
that might be a, a little bit of a signal to re-examine generally how you're feeling. Oftentimes, this sense of cynicism can also arise if you are in a workplace where you're not really, where you don't feel that you're being valued or recognized or where there are some real interpersonal uh, incivility type of things happening or difficult politics happening in an organization. These types of factors tend to turn people more inward and away from the sense of connection that they previously had with others. So when it comes to actually now that we recognise and we have a better understanding of what burnout is, can you maybe give us some tips when it comes to actually beating that burnout, recovering from it, maybe three or four tips for us? Sure, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, sometimes just actually recognising that you are really starting to suffer can be difficult. It is somewhat of a downward spiral. Once you reach the point of really hitting burnout where you're really not operating anywhere near your potential level and you're not feeling well about work and it's starting to take a toll on uh, relationships and so forth, you know, we don't always step back and recognize and say, wait a minute, I'm, you know, something is wrong. I really need to, uh, to make some changes here, possibly to get some help. And there also can be a little bit of stigma sometimes, you know, particularly if you see yourself as a really strong professional, someone who's very capable, if you start to feel, you know, it's that old imposter syndrome often can arise where you think, oh boy, I just have to keep up appearances. Um, and hopefully nobody will realize that I am sort of feeling pretty frayed on the inside. So if you are, are to the point where you're really feeling that way, one thing that's very helpful is to actually get some coaching because a coach can work with you to help you to understand, you know, what's going well, what resources you have to rely on and to help rebuild, to help you in shifting perspectives. A lot of times when we're feeling burnt out, we have different, we see th things through one lens and it's a pretty negative lens. So it can be very helpful to work with somebody to help us understand how we can reframe things and what sorts of supports we can avail ourselves of. It's crucial to, to really prioritize taking care of yourself. And it's interesting, you know, of course, people working in the fitness industry, you would think that this would be a natural for everybody that, you know, mm. you're helping other people to learn how to take care of yourself. Therefore, you must be an expert at it. But of course, you know, there are people who do run themselves a little too hard and don't take care. Or perhaps, you know, perhaps you think if I'm taking care of myself physically, if I'm working out and I'm you know, uh, my, I'm in good condition, et cetera, then everything is great. But are you also taking care of making sure that you have meaningful relationships, that you have a sense of purpose in what you're doing? Because these are also ways that you can get worn down. So really taking um, care to make sure that you are feeling well and feeling fueled, not just physically, but also in terms of mentally, your ability to focus and how you're feeling with your emotions. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, having strong interpersonal relationships, whether that's at work or outside and a sense of purpose. So those are, are things that are certainly quite important to help people to, uh, to recover. But then, of course, there's a lot that, you know, we want to do to make sure that we don't actually hit bottom that way. You know, it's funny, sometimes um, you go into an organization and you get a feel like, like, ooh, there's a lot of burnout here. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a typical example is it kind of going into a, you know, a, a dusty old bureaucratic government agency or something. I think every country has their own version of the place you get the, you know, uh, title for your car or something like that. Uh, where people seem, you know, to just sort of stare right through you yeah. or, you know, teachers in a school where there's no leadership or something of that nature. And it really is very unpleasant when you have that sense of, wow, people are, you know, people are really suffering here. And as a result, all of their clients are getting far less than they could as well. So it's, you know, it's important both for people themselves to, to feel well and to be able to be fulfilled and perform well, but also for clients to, to have good service and so forth. So I'd say, yeah, prioritizing self-care, recognizing what are the primary stressors that you're experiencing and reducing your exposure. You know, perhaps if you have one or two clients who are, you know, really 
really challenging for you on some level you know are you are you getting the are you providing the level of service that you'd like to be able to pr provide and are you getting the rewards back from those particular relationships or is it better maybe to refocus your own client work on the clients who you feel you can best serve and who you know you have best chemistry with i'm not a fitness professional so i hope myself so um, I hope hope this is uh, you know make, making sense um, or seeing what other types of, of job stressors you may be experiencing. Are there ways that you can reorient yourself a little bit away from those activities that you find particularly draining and do more of what it is that you find most fulfilling? Sometimes even just making small shifts in the content of your work can have a really big impact overall on um, how well you feel with your work. It is absolutely making sense, Monique. I can tell you that right now. And I guess from uh, what I'm hearing is the perspective that we've looked at a lot of this from is is quite a personal perspective. So what we can do individually to um, prevent or recover from burnout. If we were to put ourselves in the role of a fitness manager or a fitness leader that has a team, which may be you know five people or it might be 50 people, are there any tips or advice that you can give us on how employers or team leaders can help their team stay balanced? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you asked that question because we often make the mistake of thinking that burnout is an individual phenomenon. And really, it's something that tends to occur in interpersonal settings in organizations. And many of the factors actually are, are organizational and job in nature. So it is really important if you manage people and you want to make sure that everyone's at their best to be on the lookout, you know, and, and the signs of burnout can be quite subtle. You know, some people, when they're really stressed, they show it. Other people, it's hard to see. So if you're finding, for example, people are, you know, more withdrawn than usual or people are not uh, kind of stepping up to engage with and help other people, or they're looking particularly tired or, uh, you know, starting to be a little bit hostile, maybe some outbursts. These are signs um, that you might just want to check in and see how people are doing. In general, I think it's important to set some kind of limits on workloads. And this is kind of a funny and counterintuitive advice give to someone who's managing others because you're always wanting to, you know, kind of get the most out of everybody on your team. But on the other hand, Presumably, you want to be able to get the most out of your team on a sustainable basis over a period of time. So um, just having people kind of come in and flame out isn't necessarily a, a positive thing. You know, it, it, interestingly, I've even had some managers who have talked about needing to kind of have, you know, if you have somebody on your team who's a real perfectionist, for example, mm -hmm. who really gets stressed about, you know, making sure the tiniest details are perfect, you know, that can actually be a negative factor to have people who are too devoted to their work. And I've had uh, worked with managers, for example, to help them, you know, to, to have uh, team members who are more kind of balanced in their approach to mentor people who tend to get excessively focused on delivering a certain, their own perception of a certain level of quality, for example. You know, I think as a manager, you need to shield your team from external pressures so that they can do what they do best if there's, you know, difficulties of, of resource allocation or politics or something in a larger organization. Try and, you know, kind of push back against that and handle what you can so that they can really focus on using their skills and performing at their peak is one thing. Um, that's helpful, um, and, and really recognizing people. You know, this is a, one of the most fundamental needs that we have at work is to to be seen, to feel that we're valued. And it's easy, in a particularly in a busy, high demand environment, to just not take the time to make sure you're saying, um, and kind of publicly saying, "Wow, you guys are doing a fantastic job." You know, highlighting things that people have done, highlighting positive feedback that's coming in, good results, that sort of thing, but that can go an awfully long way in terms of helping people to feel valued and to essentially filling their fuel tanks. So those are those are some, I mean, I could go on certainly, you know, emphasizing learning is one thing I think is important. A lot of times uh, if, you know, if I as the manager um, am not willing to kind of publicly admit if there's something that I've struggled with, 
or if I've made a mistake and I've been able to learn something, you know, being open about that really helps to create a sense of trust and to make it okay for other people to extend themselves, to experiment a little, to try new things. It's a way to build a sense of a learning community rather than a place where people feel that they have to be perfect and can't show themselves to have any, um, you know, sort of difficulties or mistakes. I think that is just all fantastic advice, Monique. Thank you so much. I think something in there for us all to think about, especially if we are managing a team, and I particularly like what you talk about in regards to recognition and how much that is just a human need for us to to recognise the achievements that people have and also that ongoing education and just being open and honest and admitting, you know, we're not we're not perfect so that the team can have the opportunity to learn. So thank you so much for sharing those. They were fantastic. Now, I'm hoping that you might be able to finish up today and leave us with your Fitbizpiration. And they are your top three tips for our tribe to achieve a more balanced life and not suffer from burnout. The Fitness Business Podcast is very appreciative of our podcast partners. Here's a quick word from one of our partners. Are you interested in increasing your center's income and your trainer's income from small group training? Tribe Team Training is the new way to get more members engaged in small group training and paying extra. Click the Tribe Team Training link in the show notes or go to tribeteamtraining.com.au forward slash podcast for your free formula to see how much income you can make from small group training. Now let's go back to Monique as she leaves us with her top tips to achieve a more balanced life. Mm, Right. I think I'll dig a bit more into this. I mentioned this principle that I live by, which is to, you know, pay attention to what energizes you and what Mm -hmm. drains you. And I want to talk, just mention kind of on three different levels. So really using that as a guide, I'd like to invite all the audience to imagine that you have your own internal fuel gauge and you've got three dials on there. One is physical, one is mental, and one is emotional. And you want to make sure that uh, those those dials never go down into the empty zone. So for physical, making sure that you're getting plenty of sleep. Obviously, people who are listening to this uh, podcast are probably fitness enthusiasts, so you're taking care of yourself on that regard. Also making sure that you're eating well, that you're putting into your body, um, you know, what fuel that's appropriate for it that's going to help you sustain your physical energy. In terms of um, your mental energy, making sure to engage in some kind of practice to help you really be present, whether that's, you know, journaling, whether it's doing a little bit of meditation, making sure you're doing some reading so that you can stay on top of, you know, interesting new ideas that will give you inspiration. And in terms of uh, your emotional well-being, I'd say really help making sure that you're investing some time in relationships that are meaningful and rewarding. And there's lots and lots of different ways to do that. But community is vitally important. We're finding out, for example, that people who are living uh, to really advanced ages and thriving, one of the key things is having a community of people around you uh, that you, you know, really have a sense that you share something in common that you can contribute to that you can get help from so i love the whole way that you use this you know this idea of tribe to uh to mm-hmm. characterize your, your listeners and i think there's a lot you can take just from that idea of being an active member of your tribe oh monique i just love that and as you were talking i i had in my mind the visual of those fuel gauges and it's mm-hmm. a great representation of each of those three elements that you talked about and a great way for us to keep focused and on track with uh, with keeping that balance. So I personally have gotten so much out of listening to your advice today and your expertise, Monique, and I'm sure that our tribe has as well. So I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Precore Quick Fire 5. Luke Carlson is the founder and CEO of Discover Strength based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome along to the show, Luke. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Fantastic. Now, are you ready for your Precore Quick Fire 5 questions? I am so ready. Tell our tribe, why do you do what you do? Well, number one, I'm passionate about exercise and specifically, I'm passionate about strength training. And number two, 
I think that leading and managing people and studying the elements of leadership and management is truly the most important and rewarding work that a person can do. So those are really my two passions, and I get to do them every single day. It's a, it's a great position to be in. And tell the tribe, what's your best piece of advice that you've ever received? Well, coincidentally, in 2003, I made my first trip to the Gainesville Health and Fitness Center and made Joe, uh, met Joe Cirilli for the first time. And I'm actually sitting doing this interview right now at the Gainesville Health and Fitness Center in an office here. And Joe told me when I was 23 years old that the, the major determining factor to your success will be whether or not you commit to reading and learning by a ongoing commitment to reading. How true is that? And you know what? We had the wonderful Joe Cerulli on the show right at the beginning of when we started the Fitness Business Podcast. So I can agree with you there that he has some excellent advice. Thank you for sharing that. Tell us what's a personal habit that helps you become better at what you do. So I do on a regular basis what we call clarity breaks. So a clarity break would be defined as taking a time away from working in the business and just focusing on the business and really thinking on the business. So here's what it looks like for me. One week, a 60-minute period where I get out of the office and I have no technology with me, just a notebook in front of me, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about our goals. I'm thinking about our issues. I'm thinking about the next people move that I need to make in the company. I'm doing things to protect and promote my own confidence as a leader and a manager. So for that 60 minutes, I start with a blank notebook in front of me and start thinking on the business. And that's where my ideation and uh, some of my visionary work will originate. Now, you mentioned just earlier the importance of learning and reading. What's one book that you'd recommend and why? The one book that I recommend that all leaders and managers read is a book called Traction by Gino Wickman. I think the, the, that book is the one book that takes the vision component of the business, meaning this is what I want to accomplish or where I want to go, and brings it down to the ground with an actual uh, tangible steps for how we execute against that vision. And I think there is such a massive chasm there that exists with so many organizations and so many leaders between defining the vision and then actually bringing it down to the ground and starting to produce results on that stated vision. And Luke, tell us why should our tribe come back next week and listen to the main interview? Because I have so much to share around our unique approach to leadership and management and how we've developed our product in this industry. And more so than anything else is I just love sharing ideas, learning from other people. And I, I hope that, that the tribe can come back and, and glean some value from what I have to share in this interview. I have no doubts they're going to walk away with a bucket load of value next week. So Luke Carlson, thank you so much for joining us for the pre-call quick fire five. It was my pleasure. That's it. Short and sweet this week, tribe. So thank you so much for joining me for another week of the Fitness Business Podcast. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Great show this week that you should be suffering DOMs, delayed onset mind soreness, as you are overloaded and that's when your mind is strengthened. You and your business have been strengthened thanks to the amazing support of our premier sponsor, Active Management. Check out www.activemgmt.com.au only if you want to strengthen your business and your leadership. Don't forget all today's links and notes are found at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com where you can also subscribe and never miss a show and maybe win a prize. Next week is another incredible guest with Chantal, so get ready for more fit-bispiration. <laughs>